Hello there. I'm Johnny Fox. I preach for the Holiday Church of Christ in Cookville, Tennessee. And I want to thank you for being a part of our audience for our Bible class. We're still not having Bible classes at Holiday due to the virus. We do have opportunities to worship on the Lord's Day in smaller groups, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or 6 p.m. But uh, maybe before too long, we'll be able to start Bible classes back. But we are using these Tuesday evenings, and this is uh, Tuesday the 22nd of uh, September, that we can share together some lessons, and hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. And thank you for uh, viewing, and we'll sing together couple of songs, maybe three, have a prayer, and then uh, get into our Bible study tonight. Where is Holiday Church of Christ located? We are in Cookville, Tennessee. We're halfway between Nashville and Knoxville on the Interstate 40, I-40, and home of Tennessee Tech University. So uh, we would love for you to come and be with us anytime you might have the opportunity. That would be a blessing for sure. Okay, let's sing together couple of songs. Here's a, an old favorite that makes us think about and appreciate what our Lord has done for us. What a Savior. Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior. To save a poor lost soul like me. Oh, what a Savior of hallelujah. His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nailed scarred. His life was riven. He gave his life blood. For even me, death's chilly waters I'll soon be crossing. His hand will lead me safe o'er. I'll join the chorus in that great city and sing up there forevermore. Oh, what a Savior, oh, hallelujah. His heart was broken on Calvary. His side pins were nail scarred. His side was riven. He gave his life blood for even me. Amen and amen. He certainly did. How about this old song? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Yes, it does. He loved us enough to go for the cross for our sins. One more. What about my task? This is one of the best written songs, I think, in the book, the lyrics. To love someone more dearly every day. To help a wandering child to find its way. To ponder o'er a noble thought and pray. And smile when evening falls. And smile when evening falls. This 
is my task. And then when my Savior by and by to me, when faith had made her task on earth complete, and lay my homage at the Master's feet, within the jasper walls, within the jasper walls, this crowns my task. Would you bow with us for a word of prayer? Father, we want to thank Thee for this day and the beginning of the fall of the year. and We just see all around us Your creative glory, Father, and we praise You for it. We thank You for the hope that we have of eternal life and a home in heaven when this life is over. We pray for those families that are bereaved and lost loved ones going through a hard time, especially those that are so very sick. We pray that you'd guide and direct our scientists that we could be able to conquer this virus that has now reached over 200,000 deaths. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless and help that healing could take place, please. Please forgive our sins and weaknesses and We'll strive to the best of our ability not to repeat them and to do better. Thank you for your amazing grace and goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I wanted to think with you for just a short time tonight about some foolish thoughts. Foolish thoughts. Just work this lesson up today, and so I'm going to need to refer to my notes some, but... Uh, Got to thinking about foolish thoughts. I guess a good text might be 1 Samuel chapter 26 and 21. We read there how that King Saul is very jealous of young David. In the streets of Jerusalem, the cry of the parade route was, Saul hath killed his thousands, David hath killed his ten thousands. They gave much more glory to David's conquest and victories and uh, ability than they gave to their king. And kings don't like to be put in that kind of a position of lower of honor. And so he has become very jealous. And with a pursuit, he has commissioned his army in chief leader, Abner, to find David. And he is with the army a lot of the time in their pursuit of trying to apprehend David and his followers and put them to their death. On this particular night of 1 Samuel chapter 26, and verse 21, David and Abishai, his helper and leader of their army, out under the cover of darkness, slipped into the camp of King Saul and Abner, and beside Saul's bed, there was where he had stuck his spear right beside his head. I guess that was sort of a, something that would be ready for action. Some people uh, might use a gun in somewhat of a similar situation like that, but they didn't have guns back then, but they had spears and bows and arrows and swords. So right beside his head, there was his spear and also a canteen of water, a cruise of water. And David and Abishai go into the camp under the cover of darkness. They take the spear and they take the cruise of water. Abishai wants David to kill Saul. But David said, no, you, you're not to harm the Lord's anointed. So they leave camp and go on a hill above the camp and cry out to Abner that you're not doing a very good job of protecting your king. And all of them wake up and, is that David? And yes, that's David in the cover of darkness crying out to them. And he asks Saul, where is your spear? And where is your cruise of water? They're gone and I possess them. And that's when Saul realized if David had been an evil man, a vicious, cruel man, uh, a gainsayer, he would certainly have been easy for him to have killed King Saul right there in their own camp, Saul's camp. But he didn't do him any harm and was opposed to Abishai wanting to do harm to King Saul. That's when Saul said, I have played the fool. 
And he told David that he would leave the pursuit of him, that he would never do that again. And he asked his forgiveness. I have played the fool. We're thinking about foolish thoughts, foolish things that people do. We all say and do things very foolish at times. And we repent of them daily, no doubt. And we pray the good Lord gives us the strength and the ability not to repeat them. But I think this is a good text. 1 Samuel 26 and verse 21. I have played the fool and I have erred exceedingly. Whenever we play the fool, we err exceedingly as well. So I want us to look at some verses that might suggest to us uh, the wrongfulness of playing the fool and erring exceedingly. In Psalms 14 and verse 1, David said, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Now, why would this be considered such a foolish thing? Well, it is a complete uh, opposition to facts, to truth, and it's foolish. Driving over to the building tonight, I was looking at patches of beautiful blue sky and white sky and the clouds, and I thought to myself, you know, the glory of the heavens for sure announced the presence of God. Only God could make a universe like this. How anybody, any individual, can look at all the things that have been made, and man himself, and the blessings that we've been given, and think it just all happened. It just, just happened to be that way. No architectural design, no God in heaven, no creator, just an evolutionary process by which these things have happened. It's beyond my belief. It's foolish. That's what it is. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You're completely denying the evidence. And that's foolish to deny evidence and truth. And that's what we do when we fail to recognize the creation of this universe by God Almighty. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void without form. There was darkness upon the face of the deep. The Lord God, the Godhead, let us make man in our own image. And the image of God created he, him. Male and female created thee, them. So the creation by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, has brought this world into its existence. And it's foolish to deny such evidence. The fool saith in his heart, there is no God. We're thinking about foolish thoughts. Not only Psalms 14 and 1, Proverbs 10 and 23, it is as sport to a fool to do mischief. What does that mean? It is as sport to a fool to do mischief. It means fools engage in a lot of activities that are mischievous and wrong, sinful, sometimes dishonest and sometimes illegal but the fool in his heart says I'm going to do it anyway the fool says in his heart here's something I'm going to do when it is a decision based upon the possibility or it is a decision of wrongdoing that could lead to the possibility of being put in jail of harming or hurting someone and certainly breaking our Christian vows and commitments by unlawful deeds that's what it is to a fool. He is a fool that does such mischievous things as sport, as if it's a good thing or a fun thing to do. It doesn't have any more sense than to do foolish things is what uh, Solomon is saying in his wisdom in Proverbs 10 and verse 23. doesn't know any better. Well, it knows better, but it doesn't do any better. And it's just like a game to him. And so like a sport to a fool to do mischief is foolish. We're thinking about foolish thoughts. Proverbs 10 and verse 23 we just shared. Proverbs 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. This is one of the great causes of denominational error that exists in our world today. Many denominations teaching this and that and this opinion, that opinion, that thought and that thought, and so far away from the 
structure of the teaching of God found in his word by his teaching and example, command, example, and necessary inference so far removed from it is because of that very proverb. There's a way that seemeth right unto a fool. He's right in his own eyes. But he that hearkens to counsel is wise. We should hearken to counsel. We ought to listen to those elders and deacons and mothers and fathers and Bible teachers and preachers and God-fearing men and women who would share with us their wisdom they've gained and see that in our own eyes, yes, we make decisions that are very foolish at times. We should listen to counsel. Then we would be wise and not foolish. The way of a fool. You can't tell a fool anything, you know. He already thinks he's smart and knows it all. And so in his own eyes, He's right about everything. And so many times he's wrong about everything. All right. Proverbs 15 and verse 5. A fool despises his father's instruction. He won't listen to his father. He rejects the wisdom of his father, the experience of his father, the discipline and love of his father. That is the nature of a fool. He despises his father's instructions and makes some very grave, sad decisions. Also, there's a great story about how foolish thoughts occur in first, Second Kings chapter 5. It involves Naaman. Remember, Naaman had leprosy, and Naaman is a captain, a Syrian leader of an army, and he raids down into northern Israel, captures a little Jewish maiden, and she made the comment as he brought her into his staff at his home to his wife that if he could just see the man of God in Samaria, he could be healed of his leprosy. And so he began writing letters to the king and hoping to be able to meet with them, and the king said, oh, my God, I can't do anything about this. So Naaman takes a company of soldiers, a group of them, and goes down south to Samaria, the capital city of northern Israel, to see the man of God. And they arrive there at the location of the man of God. Some of them report to the servants their business, what they, why they were there. Elisha does not come out he sends a servant down to tell them to go to the Jordan River and dip seven times and he'll be healed. He becomes very angry, Naaman does, because it'd be about 30 more miles to the Jordan River. And he said, are not the rivers of Damascus greater than these, the Abana, the Parfer? And they had already crossed them and to cross a river was a very difficult thing in those times, of course, and very dangerous. And are these rivers not greater than, you know, the Jordan? We crossed the Abana, the Parfer. And behold, I thought that he would, the man of God would come out and strike his hands over this place. In other words, he expected a sort of a, sh a show, uh, expected a real dramatic kind of a, uh, dealing here with Naaman and and great honor and respect for him. He didn't even come out of his house. And he expected different than that. Behold, I thought. And it's that we're talking about thoughts today in our lesson, foolish thoughts. And it is very foolish for us to reason like Naaman. Well, behold, I thought. How many times have you heard people render that kind of a statement in regard to different things in the church, in the plan of salvation, in the government of the church, in the worship of the church. Well, behold, I thought. Yes, and that's what gets us into trouble. Everybody thinking they are right and they're smarter and they know more than God and God and his word. And that's wrong, wrong as it can be. Behold, I thought can get you into a lot of trouble. We ought to reason, behold, what does the Lord say? Behold, what does the Bible teach? Then we'll be on solid ground. Not on, not on what I think or what you think. That can lead us into trouble. The only way is just like Paul said, be ye fathers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 
The only way that we can follow the thinking of others is if they're following the thinking of Christ. So Naaman makes a very grave mistake in regard to thoughts when he was going to inject his thinking instead of the way it was done by God. So that's a tragic mistake when that occurs, especially in matters of faith and religion, uh, worship, government, and plan of salvation. I remember talking to a lady on one occasion years ago that um, said that her salvation was in her heart and she didn't need to be baptized, that she knew everything was all right. Well, I happen to know some of her family and some of them were involved in religious groups that I knew this particular lady did not believe nor practice and believe they were an error to the word of God. And I pointed this out to her that they in their heart think they're doing right. Just about everybody is sincere in their religion. Now there's some that are not, but you can be sincerely wrong. That's foolish thinking. Behold, I thought it needs to be behold what saith the Lord. Well, concerning thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways than your thoughts and your ways. We need to respect the chain of command there and the higher power and the higher wisdom is of course the ways of God and the thoughts of God that we should respect. Concerning thoughts, there's another interesting story from the Old Testament in Judges chapter 15 and verse 2. We find that uh, Samson had married a woman of Timnath, a Philistine, against his mother and father's wishes. He went ahead and did such. He is engaged in battle against the Philistines and is gone for a period of time. And his wife's father gave her to his friend and companion. Gave her to him. In Judges 15, Samson comes back ready to take his wife to himself. And that's when her father said, no, I can't let you do that. I've given her to your friend. And the statement is made in Judges 15 and verse 2 by her father, verily I thought. That's the same principle that we've just been discussing with Naaman, behold I thought, and the same consequences when men reject the counsel of God to their own thinking. And of course it led to great hurt. Samson went and destroyed um, much of their harvests and their crops and as well as took many lives. So there can be some hurtful action that comes out of foolish thoughts like the father of, father, excuse me, father-in-law of Samson. Concerning thoughts, Jesus said in Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, that we should not worry so much, but we cannot add to our height or take away but we should trust in the Lord and the one who feeds the birds of the heavens and clothes the lilies of the field. Will he not much rather clothe ye and feed ye? Our faith and our trust ought to be in God and that's where our thoughts ought to be instead of worrying about so many things that come along. In Mark 11 and verse 22, have faith in God, amen. That's the right thoughts. Philippians 4 and verse 19, my God shall supply all of your need in glory in Christ Jesus. Supply all of our needs. That's the thinking we need to turn to him who can supply our needs. And uh, Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms 23 and verse one, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. That's true. We will not want, we will be provided for of food, shelter, and clothing as promised by the good Lord. And that helps our faith to be renewed and our thinking. Thinking about foolish thoughts, it's foolish to think that money 
can buy the gifts of God. Oh, Simon the sorcerer had to learn that from Acts chapter 8. When he saw that Peter and John had the ability to pass on the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, verse 18 of Acts 8, he pursued following them and then approached them and said that he would like to buy the gift of giving these gifts and the ability that they had demonstrated. That's when Peter very strongly rebuked him and told him that he was in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity, that he and his money were going to perish together because of this evil that was within his heart. And he begged of Peter to help him in this situation when Peter said, repent and pray to God and perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee. He said, pray for me, Peter, pray for me. So it is that thoughts are evil when think, thinking is that we can take money and buy the things that really matter or are important. The most important thing in all is our relationship to God that's not purchased with silver and gold, but purchased by obedience and faithfulness to his will. It's foolish to leave God out of our plans as well. We're thinking about foolish thoughts. Foolish to leave God out of our plans. That happened in uh, Luke uh, chapter 12, beginning in verse 13, we read, Luke 12, 13. One of the company said to him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, I, who made me a judge or a divider over you? He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. And he spake a parable, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and I'll build greater barns. And there I'll bestow all of my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be that thou hast provided? So is he that is layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So it's foolish. God, Jesus, called him a fool, the man who seeks his fulfillment through wine, women, and song, through seeking up eating, drinking, and being merry philosophy. His treasure is in these things and not in the Almighty, having a relationship to God. He said it was foolish. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. So if, if we knew we were going to die tonight, we ought to be sure in making plans today to get things right with God. But we might die tonight, or the Lord might come back tonight. So we've got to make preparation while we can, or we're foolish. The harvester ant, Proverbs 6, makes preparation in the summer for the winter to follow. We need to make preparation in our lives and not be foolish like this rich farmer. It's foolish to leave God out of our plans. And... Uh, James 4 repeats that thought when Brother James wrote and said, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we should buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We ought to say, If the Lord will, we should do this or that. If the Lord will. So it's foolish to make plans and leave God out of His will being done. Well, we'll end our thoughts concerning uh, thoughts. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, every imagination of their thoughts were only evil continually. God knew the thoughts of man, and they were evil. And so it brought about a great flood upon this world. In Matthew 9 and 14, Jesus, in telling the man that his sins were forgiven, who was paralyzed, was rebuked, but Jesus knew their thoughts and approached them. Also in the discussion about Beelzebub, that's where Jesus got his power, the false teacher said, from the devil. He said, no, no, but he knew their thoughts. If the Lord knows our thoughts, 
then we need to be very careful about how we conduct our lives faults by which decisions are made and consequences occur we thought about evil thoughts and we've used a lot of scripture because the bible has a lot of scripture in regard to that needed subject thank you for listening to our bible class this evening i'm johnny fox i preach for the holiday church of christ in cookville tennessee and i pray that god bless you to have a good day and to god be the glory